for those of you who might not be well versed with uh, you know what fireside uh, ventures has been up to in the last uh, you know few years let me just do a quick recap uh, some of their uh, investi companies include mama earth uh, through which i read some reports which uh, say you earned a 4000x uh, you know roi uh, there is another you know famous company waiting to be listed and i'm sure many of us will look to make money through that which is boat other companies many some of them include yoga bar bombay shaving company the sleep company wadham slurp farm and these are as you can imagine some of the busiest uh, brands which have been built in uh, the last decade some of them in less than a decade and some of the recent investments include orica uh, lab grown jewelry moxi hair care frubon dairy uh, amaha mental health pilgrim beauty brand happy planet and you know i can go on with the list mr khan uh, you know i will start uh, with a you know slightly off topic question you know uh, he spent many years at hul and we were just talking about uh, uh, you know how uh, hul is kind of a school for ceo sudhir sitapati one of his uh, uh, one of his prodigies wrote a book a few years back about hul being the uh, ceo factory what is about that company that you know gives rise to leaders like yours who uh, who go on to do big things like these so that's a very deep uh, question uh, novel and as you said lots of things have been written about it and it is true that uh, levers have produced uh, many leaders uh, who have created a lot of value in india and outside one of the things about uh, levers is the way it picks uh, talent and talent recruitment is seen to be something very very important senior managers of levers go out and find talent whether it's business schools or lateral entries it's something that all of us has spent time uh, identifying talent getting them in after that the amount of effort which goes into grooming the talent and identifying fairly early people with the potential to scale to you know larger roles is also a lot of time effort money goes into that it's taken again very very seriously the third thing i would say is that it's a very challenging culture you know you might have done very well but on 31st december everything gets reset and you are challenged again to rise back and to come up with uh, new levels of performance new ways of not just doing what you did last year better but new ways of doing things so there is always this constant challenge of having to reinvent uh, how you create value and i think all of this together is what creates uh, outstanding leadership fantastic and you know uh, it's like being in levers playing a t20 match every day you're as good as the score you made you know yesterday uh, you know levers uh, has been over the decades known as a company that you know created disruption in the market and now you know you have so many of these brands that you've looked at in the last decade or so which are truly disrupting the market space in you know many many sectors given where we are you know in 2024 and from your vantage point what are the disruptive things that you see uh, say in the consumer brand space that are happening which will shape the sort of d2c uh, space in the next say 24 to 36 months so in fact uh, we started fireside way back in uh, 2017 so it's about 7 years into our uh, journey and we came in with the belief that uh, the indian consumer is changing the indian environment is changing and all of this is going to be uh, a lot of room for disruption we felt that uh, india was getting to be more affluent and the last 7 years have shown that that is indeed so we believe that over the next few years again that affluence is only going to increase uh, and as people grow more affluent they going to ask for things which are better suited for uh, what they are what they want and that means that there is going to be room for more brands we believe that the big companies uh, see this but they they do not feel the need to respond at this stage because these changes are happening in a way which do not significantly impact their financials in a short time period 
The other piece is the whole digital commerce which has uh, uh, shaped up over the last few years. We saw that happening in 2017. We never imagined how big it was going to be the way it has worked out today. And we believe that process has just started. We think the way digital commerce is morphing, the, you know, the, the advent of not just uh, Flipkart and Amazon, but all the vertical e-commerce guys, uh, the way quick commerce has emerged, all of this is giving room to a lot of opportunity. And the big advantage of that for startups is that you don't have to face uh, the disadvantage of playing in the same playing field as the big companies. So you can actually work with many of these uh, you know, changes in the digital commerce landscape and shape it to your advantage. So we think all of these are fundamental uh, factors, whether it's the demographics or the way the digital economy is shaping up. And that's where I think we are very excited about how we see the world of startups coming and therefore we think there is a tremendous future, at least from a Pfizer perspective, of creating or participating in the creation of many, many more wonderful new brands in this country. Yeah, let me take you up on quick uh, commerce since that's the kind of flavor of the season. You know, Swiggy uh, uh, IPO is imminent. Uh, Zepto is likely to go for an IPO sometime soon. Amazon, Flipkart have already kind of entered the space. Uh, there's Zomato also there. So that space seems to be exploding. Uh, uh, Zepto has also recently uh, launched their FNB sort of, uh, you know, quick commerce play. So that's an interesting space, especially in like a country like India that's like mushrooming, exploding. From a sort of investor standpoint, how do you see that impacted, impacting the kind of sectors that you deal in? What are the opportunities and also challenges and threats that it poses to D2C brands? There are many sort of D2C companies in this room who would be looking at, you know, using quick commerce as their, you know, go-to approach in the next two years. What do you think is, you know, how, how do you think is this uh, space going to shape up for D2C brands? So the whole uh, journey of quick commerce is perhaps, what, two years old, three years old. So, and in that very brief period of time, uh, our understanding, their understanding of what is quick commerce has been changing. Uh, I know I've been interacting with some of the quick commerce uh, guys and go back a couple of years, they were talking about convenience. They were talking about delivery in 10 minutes. They were talking about, you know, can I get uh, food products across? Can I get uh, stuff which is really, as they call it, a bit of a crisis at home uh, kind of categories. Uh, so that helped because things like a lot of food brands, which were not doing terribly well with an Amazon or a Flipkart, suddenly found there was a platform on which they could flourish. So like we have invested in a, a snacking company called Sweet Karam Coffee. They're doing very well on, on quick commerce. Uh, and Slurp Farm, for example, again, doing very well on that. Yoga Bar is doing very well on that. So that was a very natural kind of uh, uh, you know, thing for them. And therefore, we are looking at also, therefore, more food businesses to invest in. Uh, because now we see digital commerce evolving for categories like that. But the thinking of the, the quick commerce area has just changed so much because now it's become not just about convenience, it's become a shopping platform. And people are now going to a Blinkit or a Swiggy Instamart or a Zepto, not just because they want to buy something in the next 10 minutes, but it's just a place for them to go and search for things to, to buy. So like, uh, you know, Albinder at uh, uh, Blinkit was telling me that they launched Gazers on uh, on Blinkit, of all things, right? So Wait now, till we get luxury cars on Blinkit. <laughs> yeah, soon you should be getting that too. So, you know, there is a, the, the whole world of digital commerce is being reshaped and it just started with quick commerce, but it's all about now, where do you want to shop? And I think that's a fundamental change. Yeah, I mean, Indians are known as, you know, spoiled customers world over. When you have friends visiting from outside India, they're shocked at you know, how the quick commerce space is uh, you know, shaping up, exploding at such a fast pace and also the things that you can, the variety of stuff that you can you know, get within 10 minutes. Let me uh, you know, talk to you about uh, Fireside's you know, main focus which is consumer brands and you know, uh, I briefly mentioned about health and wellness brands. Uh, uh, 
you know, Mama Earth is a company that you invested in very early on, and that company has gone on to build, uh, you know, for lack of better words, iconic brands within a such a short period of time. What are companies like, you know, Mama Earth? Uh, what are what have they done right that has led them to, you know, where they are? And what are the lessons that you would have for, you know, entrepreneurs in the consumer space who might be sitting in the room? from so many others, you know, for every Mama Earth that there might be, you know, 20, you know, which you uh, saw did not invest or you invested, they did not do as expected. So what are the lessons you would have for entrepreneurs? So you're right about for every Mama Earth, there are 20 which don't uh, make it. And I, I have personally learned a huge amount by watching how Varun and Ghazal have shaped that, uh, that company. Uh, if you were to look at their journey, and the journey started in, towards the end of 2016 when they launched their first set of uh, products. So it's not a very long uh, journey. It's now a market cap of about $2 billion, which has been created in a very, very short period of time. So the first thing, it can be done if you get it right. So what did they get right? I think first there is a whole journey. And they've made the journey very, very meticulously, starting with saying, okay, we've got an insight, which is that uh, the products that are available in India that, you know, mums want to use on babies. A lot of mums out there feel they are not fit to be used on babies. So can we create products which are safe to use? So they launched a slew of products. There was a great reception to those products. But then they realized that a lot of mums were saying, hey, can I get products which are safe to use for me? Right? So very, very strong listening to what consumers were saying, not just about the use case that Mama Earth was presenting, but other use cases as well. And they realized that was a much bigger opportunity. So very soon, within I think about a year and a half, two years of launch, they started coming out with a range of products for adults, right? So the first journey is to think about what is your product market uh, fit? And they got that right. The second part of the journey was to say, okay, if this is a product market fit, what kind of categories do I therefore have a right to play in, have a right to win. And they started picking those categories. The third part of the journey was saying, look, all the products that I can make can be imitated, right? There are quick followers. So if I've launched a, an Upton face wash, it doesn't take a long time for somebody else to launch an Upton face wash or an onion hair oil and so on. So the, the moat is not in the product. The moat is in the brand, and how do I create a brand? So they invested very, very strongly in brand building, in creating affinity between the consumer and the brand, and therefore looking at how people just don't buy the product once, but buy the brand again and again and again. Very early in the game, they started looking at what their brand stands for with consumers, comparing their brand with very well-known brands in the country brands like Dove, brands like Himalaya. So they were really pitching their ambitions very high, saying, look, if, what does Mama Earth stand for? What does Dove stand for? What does Himalaya stand for? What is XYZ brand that I want to be compared with? And am I, how am I stacking up? And what can it do to reduce the gap between me and those brands? So very, very strong focus on brand love and customer retention. And that, so that's one whole part of the journey. The other part of it is, was very strongly focused on financials, right? Because the game is not about burning a lot of money. At least we at Fireside believe that if you're building a good brand, you should be able to be profitable in a fairly short period of time. And Mama Earth proves that it's possible to do that. And they did it. So they didn't use a lot of cash to create the brand that they did, actually because they were focusing on all the good things. They were focusing on getting the, the margin profile right. They were focusing on acquiring customers uh, efficiently. They were focusing on retaining customers. They were focusing on what more can I sell to customers that I already have, right? And all of that meant that you're building this virtuous cycle, right, which makes, uh, you know, good commercial sense. So I would call out some of that as some of the things that they did. I would also say one more thing, that they uh, fairly early on said we need to build a good team, right? And they started doing that. I can remember, 
I think they made their first sort of senior hire towards the end of 2018, early 2019, right? Maybe therefore a year and a half after we invested. And I can remember Varun coming and telling me that that is such a good decision that I took. I'm surprised that, you know, I should have done it much earlier because the kind of bandwidth that it unlocked in my time was just phenomenal. And I recruited a guy who could do that job that he's doing much better than I could do it, right? So all of these were value unlocks, which helped the company uh, scale up. So, I mean, I can go on, but- Fantastic points, you know, things. talent, look at talent closely, uh, keep an eye on, you know, financial metrics, very important because, you know, first five years of funding were just blow money, you know? Uh, there were investors sitting with checks and all you had to do was, you know, how much can you burn uh, every month, acquire customers, but, you know, retention, uh, creating a brand sometimes gets confused with, you know, uh, customer acquisition, both are not the same thing. And, you know, uh, let me uh, take you up on the sort of next part, which is about, you know, how do sort of, how do you build these brands? How do you, how do you ask your, you know, investee companies to look at the, you know, marketing funnel? That is very important, you know, in the advertising business, there has been a debate in the last few years about, uh, you know, all of this P venture capital money having come in and uh, asking uh, D2C companies to uh, invest increasing amounts of money in quick customer acquisition while not paying enough attention to, you know, the long-term sustainability of a brand. And that's kind of also partially the reason why in the last three, four years, you've suddenly seen so many brands have, companies have fallen off the cliff. They did not have a sustainable brand. Uh, when you uh, overdo uh, performance marketing, you're not creating a you know USP. There is no uh, reason for customers to choose you over the other. So how do you look at you know your investee companies looking at you know building a brand over time? At what point do you start start scaling up marketing efforts? So uh, you know the initial part of the journey is about performance marketing because many of the companies are. Uh, looking at targeting people who are already searching for a solution, right? And that makes a lot of uh, sense. But sometime along the journey, you're going to find that performance marketing is giving you declining uh, rewards. You're going to find the slope declining, and you've got to assume that it's going to decline, right? And you've got to assume that you know, the cost of acquiring a customer who is already searching for a solution is only going to keep increasing. And, you know, if therefore you're ready and you're sensing that ahead of the curve, that's when you start marketing efforts. That's where you start building demand for what you're offering. That's where you start creating maybe, it may be category creation in some manner, or it may be about creating a demand for a different kind of solution to what's available in the market but you've got to be ahead of the curve. And therefore, we are very, very sensitive to looking at things like ROASs and LTVs to think about, look, are we hitting that inflection point? And as we sense the inflection point, the conversation of the companies is about saying, you know, what are we doing at the top of the funnel? Are we therefore looking at broadening the top of the funnel? And there is a role then for performance marketing that doesn't go away. But you've got to start balancing out different parts of the funnel. And you've got to then say, how do I get people into the funnel as much as how, I, how do I convert people who are already into the funnel into customers? Uh, another point, you know, I think it's becoming increasingly important for D2C companies across sector is also uh, from being a digital first companies, many are now foring in increasingly into the omni-channel space. You know, create physical customer touch points, you know, and this is a different kettle of fish altogether, right? You're competing with large established brands who already have distribution networks built over, you know, generations who have, you know, customers who go and look for those products. What are the, what are the key areas that D2C brands that need to focus on when you're going from a digital first approach, say to an omni-channel uh, approach? So the, uh, I mean, uh, there are different forms of, uh, offline or, uh, you know, retail, and in each category that can vary. Let me therefore stay with the whole BPC area for just simplicity. Um, when uh, Mama Earth went uh, offline, they were actually a fairly well-known brand, and uh, 
it was towards sometime in 2020 that they actually started going offline. So we're talking about three odd years after they had been in the market. Uh, the brand got, got well known. Retailers were being asked whether they're stocking the brand, right? So that's when they went uh, offline. Uh, but it's not that they went straight and went into 100,000 outlets uh, straight away. They were fairly selective about where they went. They looked at where their D2C footprint was. And when you look at you know, the localities where you find a lot of your D2C business coming from, that's where you start thinking about going offline. So the second question is, when you go offline, uh, do you have the right uh, SKUs for that market? Which of all the products that you sell should you go uh, uh, offline uh, with? How do you enable discovery in a retail outlet? These are all important questions to answer. So let's start with the product category first. I mean, uh, retailers have well-defined categories. So you, you go to an aisle and you say it's marked coffee or it's marked shampoo. So you know you're going to find shampoo out there. If you've got a shampoo in your repertoire, okay, you can go into the shampoo shelf and you are found out there. Now, if you've got a business built around serums, what do you do? Because most retailers don't have a category called serums, right? Now, how do you then enable a customer to walk in and buy serums, right? You need to find a solution for that. A lot of D2C businesses are built on very large pack sizes. You know, a 500 ml bottle of shampoo selling for maybe a few hundred rupees. That has got very limited offtake in a retail outlet. You need to find the right, right SKUs for that. So all these are challenges which are uh, different uh, about going offline, that you need to find the right products, the right uh, SKUs, and enable discovery. There is another peculiar challenge. Because D2C brands have grown up with having these big sale days, you know, crazy discounts, uh, big billion offers on Flipkart and all of that. Now, retailers are also smart. They are looking at all these events happening. And when you've got a big event happening, they are the guys sitting out there and buying case loads of your product. Okay? And then they're discounting what your distributor is selling out there. So how do you handle channel conflict? That starts becoming another issue to tackle. So, uh, you know, there are uh, several things that you've got to think about when you go from being digital first to being omnichannel. And, uh, but the fact is, there is no such thing as a pure digital shopper. Consumers are going to shop where they want to shop. And sooner or later, you've got to track where the consumer is going and be available out there, or you're going to forego demand. Absolutely. Don't care where my product comes from as long as I get it. Uh, last question. I know you have a flight to catch. Uh, uh, you know, you, you look at this entire consumer brand uh, space very closely. Outside the portfolio of your investee companies, which are the brands that you admire that have been built over the last five, six years? If you have some tips for entrepreneurs here in the room in terms of, you know, what are the kind of brands they should look to emulate? Obviously, uh, listening to consum consumers is very important. Like we started the conversation about, you know, HUL, they still have a role, a young sales manager, travel the length and breadth of the country, you know, even if your brand, a um, mass brand, you know, like a RIN, you would, or Lifebuoy, for example, you would spend months, sometimes years in, you know, Bihar and Eastern UP, traveling, listening to customers, listening to your distributors if you're going, you know, physical retail. Uh, so what would be some, you know, brands that you look outside of your industry companies from whom a lot of learnings can be brought to the table? So I'm not going to name any names, but <laughs> I can tell you something. Um, we are very conscious that we don't want to miss a good deal. Um, so we internally took on a challenge of trying to put out a list of what we thought were the top D2C oriented uh, deals which were there over the last few years. And we then said, what percentage did we invest in? What percentage did we see? Uh, and what percentage did we therefore not invest in, etc.? I'm happy to say that the percentage that we saw was a very healthy number. The percentage that we invested in was a very healthy uh, number. 
And there were several that we couldn't invest in because it was a serious conflict uh, with the brands that uh, we had uh, already in, uh, in, in the portfolio. Um, but the, 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 um, uh, the, the thing is that uh, what, what we look for is, uh, is, is, the, is, is the, the business that we are looking at, is there a strong consumer insight? Right? Is there a strong problem that is being uh, solved? Uh, is that something which is going to be at scale? Is the solution that is being thought about something which is very differentiated uh, from what is there in the market? Is it digital friendly? And lastly, around the founders, are they looking to build a great business? We're not checking out, are they looking to build great valuation? Because we think that if you're building a great business, you're going to get great valuations. And lastly, do they want a partnership or do they want money? Right? I think we offer a partnership. We are willing to roll up our sleeves, work with companies. We get into really figuring out how to develop an ecosystem which supports a company. And if that's the kind of relationship which uh, founders are interested in, we would be very, very happy to invest. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sure when the next uh, piece of news comes out about your next investment, we'll have the answer to that question. Uh, uh, we could go on with this conversation whole day, but you know, there is a, I, I see times also up. Thank you so much. I hope you found it insightful. Thank you, Mr. Khan.